the ideas and the actual observations that we'll talk about today have evolved because of many people making contributions, not only from our laboratories, but, but many laboratories. And they, in many ways, are closely related and have, have similar ideas. So one of the things that's important is what's unique about what we're going to talk about today. And there's many studies related to spinal cord injury that's related to stimulation. And you find there are many technologies with different neuromotor disorders that are focused on stimulation of the brain, deep brain stimulation, and stimulation of the spinal cord for pain, in fact. So it's important to understand what is really unique about what we are talking about today. What we're talking about today does not represent a cure. It should not be uh, uh, represented as a cure for spinal cord injury, but we think it represents some breakthrough ideas, something to build on. And we think <clears throat> that what, we, what we're presenting uh, represents a first generation, but we expect there to be many generations following where we can continue to improve because we've learned so much from this, uh, from this first uh, effort uh, in implanting uh, epidural stimulation. So what's, what's unique about what we're doing? Okay, we have an individual that with complete motor paralysis, that is, it could not move any muscles below the lesion. And now <clears throat> he has progressed to the, uh, to the point where he can stand for a few minutes and you can hear some of those details. And he can step with assistance. Uh, and eventually, he's regained some voluntary control of his lower legs. Now, how did this happen, and what's, what's unique about what we're doing? Now, one of the things that most people think about when they think about spinal cord injury is when there's an injury, everything below the injury basically dies and is non-functional. But in fact, in most spinal cord injuries, the injury is the, the damage to the tissue is just for a few segments. Not all injuries, but most injuries. And all those cells and neurons below that remain intact. The other thing that's important to realize is that these neurons are very smart. They know what to do. Uh, they play a major role in your normal movement. And what we're trying to take advantage of is say, OK, these cells remain in the spinal cord after injury. To what extent can we take advantage of the control that these cells are capable of. So one of the things, what can these cells do? These cells, basically, they can feel. They can sense all the sensory information that's coming from the legs when you're sitting and standing and walking. These cells have the, the sense they can feel. They know exactly what's happening to your lower limbs. So the other thing that these cells can do is not only can they sense and feel what's happening, but they know what to do next. They know that if you're standing on one leg and your joints are in a certain position, that that's a sign that you're, you're getting ready to step. Or if you're loading, you, you've got equal load on both feet, then that's an indication that you're, you're, uh, you're standing. So see that you have, the, you have the spinal network that's reserved. To what extent can we take advantage of it? <clears throat> and so what we've been able to do, based on uh, <clears throat> quite a few years of animal research, uh, we, we've tested whether these same properties or very similar, qualitatively similar properties are present in, in the human subject. And <clears throat> uh, these, uh, for example, uh, we have reported over the last uh, several years where rats that are, have a complete spinal transaction can step with full weight support. They can step forward, backward, and sideways, and so forth. So that, what that tells us is that the sensory system is important in the spinal cord in these animals. And what, what our real question was here, do we have similar properties in the human? And so I think that uh, we have kind of found out that, that it does. But we had to do something special. We had to do something special with the rat, and we have to do something special with with the, uh, with the human. Even though these cells have this capability to sense and respond to the sensation, it needs help. And we have, in, the, in our uh, experiments today that we're explaining, we're using one intervention, and that's epidural stimulation. We're taking electrodes, 
electrode array and, and inserted over the top of the spinal cord, and uh, uh, Dr. Hodes will tell you more about that. <clears throat> but the point is, is that for these cells to fill and respond, it needs this it needs this tonic continuous stimulation with certain properties, and that's much of, over this last year or so, much of the effort has gone toward trying to figure this, uh, figure this out, how we, exactly how we, should, uh, how we should stimulate. So basically, another way of looking at this is when we stimulate the spinal cord, we're basically changing the mood of the spinal cord. This concept of physiological state is something the scientists would understand, but what this really means is we're changing the properties of the circuitry so that it's able to hear this information that's coming in. I often think of the analogy of a, of a, of a hearing aid. I mean, the sensory information is coming into the ear, but it needs to be amplified. The brain can't sense it and interpret it, and it needs help. And we're giving the spinal cord help by giving epidural stimulation. So with the combination of these things, uh, we've found some, I think, pretty surprising results. But there's one more key factor, and that is all this time when we've been going through these stimulation parameters, uh, we've, training has been going on almost every day, r some type of rehabilitation, and Dr. Harkema will tell you more about that. But that's key. That's a very key part of this whole process, and it's emphasizing the importance of rehabilitation in this intervention and probably true for other interventions. Now another surprising observation was when Rob uh, regained voluntary control of his leg. None of us believe that. I was afraid to believe it when we, we first saw it. But uh, it's, it's true. But a very important point here, and this is what's so important for the future, I think, is that this demonstrates a concept, and it's a new concept. And it demonstrates that you can regain voluntary control, but the voluntary control is only regained in the presence of the stimulation. In other words, he still does not have voluntary control without the stimulation. So see, we've changed the properties of these neurons. So now, not only does the sensory information from the legs have access, to this circuitry and can do these things that we're talking about. But now the brain, somehow the brain has regained. We have no idea what the mechanisms are, but it's pretty certain that this stimulation and the training has resulted in, in changes in the brain, changes in the spinal cord. And so uh, uh, we, we, we are very anxious to pursue this and see to what extent, uh, and, and really what the, uh, primarily what the mechanism is. We need to know how this occurred. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we've got one individual that we've studied, and it's an N of one, uh, but these things, um, <clears throat> the observations that we've made have really changed the way we see uh, how this might function. Thank you.